Now, in the last few uh, videos, we've been talking about the process of wave formation and how yeah, the waves are actually formed uh, and change depending on different conditions of the ocean environment. Um, now, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the different kinds of waves. Now, remember that waves are formed because of wind. And here you have one of the theories that it tries to explain why um, winds form. And this particular theory says that as the wind blows through the surface of the water, it actually rides the surface of the water like a wing uh, rides the wind. And that creates actually a pressure difference because the back of the wave actually catches the wind while the front of the wave actually releases that wind. And so there's more pressure on the back of the wave than in front of the wave, which actually pushes the wave forward because of that. Makes sense. Um, another theory is that the wave particles, the wind particles actually hit the water uh, particles. So the air particles actually hit the water particle and push that particle forward, right? And then um, those particles are forced in a retrograde motion by the particles which are returning it from the same collision. We'll explain what that is in a second, which then creates a circulation pattern. But each particle that, that actually uh, moves forward hits another particle that then also moves forward. And then successively another particle that also moves forward. And then little by little, particle by particle, the wave propagates in a circular motion. But um, you, then you have the rocking back motion or the elasticity back motion. And then the particles will hit each other backwards as they return in this circular pattern. pattern. And so the, if you look individually at each particle, it never actually leaves its place. Although remember we talked about the fact that the top it receives more wind than the bottom does, so there's technically a small uh, current on the front of the wind. So this, um, uh, these two theories are just two different ways of looking at what actually causes the wave motion to propagate uh, throughout, throughout the wave. One talks about eddies formed because of pressure differences in the air, which push the wave, and the other talks about collisions between particles and the elasticity of water, bringing it back and into a back and forward motion. Now, one thing is for sure. If two waves are generated right next to each other, and then another wave collides with another wave, so in other words, a wave uh, generated from one side, another wave generated from one side, when they collide, what's going to happen depends on the timing and the size of the waves. If you have two waves which are uh, meet each other on alt alt alternating times, so in other words, when this one is high, that one is low, when that one is low, that one is high. When that ma happens, you basically the bottom of one cancels out the top of the other and you end up with a flat ocean surface. So waves can cancel each other when they hit each other if they're timed just right. Or in other words, uh, if waves are not timed in a certain way, they will actually cancel each other out, what's called a destructive wave, form, wave pattern. And when we talk about interfering forces, that's what I mean by destructive fo forces. Now in constructive forces, they will actually happen when one wave collides with another and actually enhances the wave and makes it an even larger wave. So that will be our constructive waves in here because the top, the, each, uh, each crest of the wave combines. Uh, and, on a, and then in a mixed wave, you get that when you get two different waves or the two different waves or two different frequencies and two different heights. And when you combine with each other, you have a, a resulting wave which is actually a mixture of both waves. And so you see that the understanding what kind of wave actually forms depend on a variety of factors including uh, air pressure, particle collisions, and also how different waves interact with each other. Now there's definitely, there's, there's definitely uh, basically four different types of wave in the ocean. Uh, one wave is barely moving the surface of the water, we call those area waves, and they happen because of uh, uh, small oscillations of the surface of the water. The ones that most people think of waves are our stoke waves, uh, which are those basically the rocking back and forth of the, uh, it looks like a sine wave. Sometimes you also have solitary waves, especially when you have some sort of a catastrophic event which creates a swell-like wave. And sometimes you have conoidal waves, or waves which are generated mostly because of combination or constructive events, like we talked about before. Uh, so when you get these constructive waves, you end up getting these uh, conoidal waves. Stoke waves is what you get uh, with just a singular wave motion in a repetitive function. Now, what happens here uh, on this graph at the bottom here is trying to show you how different factors that lead to wave formation combine to actually create and destroy waves. So let's start from, from waves generated by wind. There are four categories of waves generated by wind, from infragravity waves 
to capillary waves. Now, capillary waves are waves which are barely, barely scratching the surface of the water. These are we're talking about very short wavelength, not a lot of energy. This like the back, basically just turbulence in the surface of the water, and the waves are barely skimming off the surface. That's when the wind first starts to blow, or the winds, or when the waves just cut the fetch. And basically, all that the wave has to break to make a capillary wave is the surface tension of the water. Now, surface tension is a force that exists because the water wants to stick to itself. The water likes to cohese, cohesion. There's strong cohesion because of the high polarity of the water molecules. And so, the, in order to make the wave actually happen, these particles have to stop hitting each other and move in chaotic ways. And so, that means that they have to break the connections between these particles which in, that means you have to break the surface tension of the water or the or the or the what keeps the water flat in the top remember how water actually seems to have a layer of skin that some bugs actually lay on top of you need to break that surface tension in order to create a wave and so all the capillary waves do is break that surface tension but they never get strong enough to break the second reason why the waves need to break before they can get big to get bigger than that Waves need to actually be strong enough to break gravity. Because remember, we talked about this in the previous video. The gravity of the ocean, of the earth, is holding the oceans to its surface. And so it's preventing the waves from actually going up and down because it's trying to keep it on the floor. The same way it's hard for you to jump up because of gravity. You know, you have to spend energy to do that. And so you're going to need a certain amount of energy to break the, both the surface tension and the gravity. Now, once the wind actually gets to a certain speed or it's been blowing for long enough, you're going to break the surface tension and the gravity, and then you have something that's called ultra-gravity waves. They're still weak. You can see them here, and they're still going to hit very, very often. And these, this is when you start getting the, the, bracket, the, break, the breaking of the water, and you start seeing a little fluctuation of this water. Well, when you get to the point of stoke waves, is the ones that normally hit, the ones that come on the beach every 30 seconds or so or every minute or so, those normal ocean waves that rock up and down and up and down, those are the normal gravity waves where the wind is now strong enough and all it has to break is that gravity, but it starts to become strong enough to break it. And as the waves pick more and more wind, the, those waves will get bigger and bigger until they max out and get stronger and stronger. All right? Now, as, as the winds actually get even stronger, all right, and then you have even less gravity, the waves actually start to become so large that they collapse under their own weight and then uh, they actually become less large and less intense because of the destructive events because of all these waves collapsing you generate even more waves which destroy each other so when the waves gets too large they actually start to collide against each other and destroy each other and so that actually reduces the frequency of the waves and makes the waves collide uh, rarer and that's what we call the infragravity waves what hap which happen when Either when the winds are really strong and it's causing the waves to collapse, or when the when the gravity um, is not too strong, and so the the, the 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 waves are allowed to grow too big, and then collapse under their own weight. Now remember that ultra gravity waves will happen either if the wind is not strong enough to break gravity, or if gravity is is uh, really really strong, and then you you won't you won't be able to break that uh, that force trying to keep the thing the thing to the earth. Now remember that the amount of gravity placed in the ocean actually changes throughout the day because the moon is pulling at the oceans. So the force of the moon actually uh, reduces the gravity uh, that the earth is putting on the ocean. So throughout the day, uh, you're going to have a fluctuation of the wave patterns because of fluctuations in gravity. When there's more gravity, you're going to have more ultra-gravity waves which are weaker, more rapid waves. When you get a little more gravity, but a little more uh, or a little less gravity, you're going to get normal gravity waves. And when you have even less gravity, you have infragravity waves because those waves start to collapse and deorganize. All right? And the same thing is true about if you start getting more and more and more wind. Now, there are some waves that form where gravity is not a factor. In other words, these are events so large, so catastrophic, that it's going to move the surface of the water whether or not there is wind or gravity. So there are some types of waves which are generated without wind, and w gravity is not a factor here. The waves are so massive that it's not a factor. Now, when you talk about the energy of these waves, the waves themselves don't have that much energy because they are 
extremely long waves. They have a very, very slow frequency, which means they hit very far apart from each other, which means that the wave energy is very low. But because this happens, because one catastrophic event, it, it tends to be uh, very long period waves. Examples of that are, are waves caused by storm systems where gushes of wind blow a whole swell of waves towards the beach or tsunami-like waves where massive earthquake or landslide or meteor strike causes a massive wall of water to come through. But that wall of water actually doesn't have that much energy, uh, not too many waves. It's going to be one wave hitting and then maybe later, much later, another wave will hit. And it can be hours, like 12, 6 hours between each successive wave. And, well, these waves extend anything between 5 minutes in between them, which are the stronger ones, until hours in between them, which are long period waves caused by these massive events. Now, I don't want you to get confused. When you think of a tsunami, you think of a wave of massive power. Yes, it does have massive power, and yes, it's moving very fast. But what's happening with this wave, it's not, make, it's not making many waves. It's making one large pulse. And then the next pulse is going to be really far away. So when you look at the wave, because when you think of a wave, it's not just a pulse. It has to be many waves going up and down. You think of a very large wave when you think of a tsunami. So basically that energy is distributed in a very large part of, part of the ocean. So you don't have, you wouldn't call that very strong energy. What causes the destructive power of the tsunami is the fact that it's moving very, very fast. And because it comes with a lot of water all at once, so that's where the destructive power comes from. And also, as they approach the beach, they actually gain height and intensity. And so, but out in the open ocean, you're talking about short, low energy waves, which are really far apart. Now, although these waves don't have to break gravity, there is a force that disrupts those waves. And that's the Coriolis force. We talked about that in a previous video. And it's the idea that because of the inertia of the Earth spinning, um, uh, just like the winds, waves have to, have to turn, and currents, waves have to turn around the curvature of the Earth as the Earth is spinning, causing these geostrophic currents, and the waves have to ride these bulges. And so these bulges, like, just like islands interfere with the wave propagation, these bulges also interfere with wave propagation. And when you're talking about these extremely large period waves, these long waves, with extremely large wavelengths, the Coriolis effect is going to really affect that. Remember that when you, tra when you travel over long distances, that's, wh that's when you especially see changes w because of the Coriolis effect. And so these waves, since they have such long wavelengths, are going to be very affected by the Coriolis force. Now, the last kind of wave is a very weak kind of wave that barely, you barely notice that the wave even exists. And some people don't even consider a wave. They call them tides. But these are called transtidal waves or waves that have something to do with tides. Now, these are the waves that come, that you would say the ocean basically coming in. Hours later, it comes out. Then it comes in again. Then it comes out again. And these things are caused because of the gravity of the sun and the moon pulling on the Earth's surface. And again, all the only thing they have to beat is the Coriolis force in order to be able to do that, all right? But the, and to create these things, by the way, since there is a Coriolis force in place, these tidal forces, just like the tsunami-like forces, and since they're even weaker and even longer, are really going to be rotating and turning because of the Coriolis force, which is going to be disrupting this wave. But if there's enough tidal force, enough gravity of the sun and the moon combining, you are going to get a tidal wave and therefore a tidal bulge. When we talk about tides, I'm going to bring this back and talk about how tides have to break the Coriolis force in order to actually become uh, uh, clear on the environment. And which is why some places actually see less tides than others because it will experience more or less of a Coriolis force effect. Now what this is trying to say to you is that winds, massive events, and tides can all create waves. Okay? But, but the... In order to do that, they have to break either the surface tension or the Coriolis force or the gravitational force of the Earth, which is preventing those waves to form. But with enough wind, an event that's catastrophic enough, and if it's big enough, the wave is still going to be present, even in the presence of these forces, which is trying to stop them. Now, depending on the different combination of these things, 
you're going to get different kinds of waves, which will have different kinds of shapes, depending on how they interact with other waves, either constructively, destructively, or mixed, uh, and so forth. And I hope you now give a general understanding of these different kinds of waves.